Good morning, I'm Jim Roselli. You want to say that again, Russ? I'm Russ Dietrich this morning. Boy, does that sound good. <laughs> yeah. And welcome to the times of your life. Uh. The times of your life brought to you each Saturday this morning by the Mariner's Pier Restaurant, by Jamestown Savings Bank, by the Camera Infirmary, the Granary, Tanglewood Manor, Time Warner Cable, Esquire Cleaners, and Rowan's Taylor Rental. It's a boy, beautiful day, Russell. Oh, it's magnificent out there, isn't it? A good day to play a doubleheader, huh? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Russ, we're all set for uh, an interesting, what we think will be an interesting visit with a young man. But first... <laughs> opportunity we have this morning to visit with a young man and I, I I'll say this frankly he's young enough not to <laughs> not to know anything about 1940 even 1950 and, and yet the subject matter of this interview is with a man who's written about minor league baseball which goes back 50 years in Jamestown New York you know David Moulet you weren't even a gleam in your father's eye in 1944 1945 I don't even remember 1970 <laughs> <laughs> this is 1990 how old are you I'm 23 23 and you're only going back to 1973 <laughs> and yet you're writing a book in which the history of minor league baseball in our town is the is the year 1944-45 well it's uh, an actual the story the real story begins in 1941 but we've got flashbacks that go back to 1830 so i obviously don't remember back that quite that far <laughs> so why does a 23 year old student uh, find a fascination with uh, minor league baseball and particularly jamestown new york I think it was in uh, probably the summer of 1992. I was a, a junior at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do my senior thesis on uh, for, yeah, for, I guess, it, which was 1994. And I read uh, David Lamb's book, uh, which was called Stolen Season, and he traveled around in a Winnebago and stopped in it at ball clubs around, around the country. And I just fell in love with the whole scene. There was something about the whole thing that, that just drew me in. Uh, contacted some general managers around at some ball clubs, and Tom O'Reilly, who was the general manager here uh, with the Expos in 1993, just rolled out the red carpet. Next thing I knew, I was living in Jamestown and traveling around with the ball club, uh, you know, sharing the hotels, sharing the buses, and, and the whole minor league experience. Uh, David, did you find any surprises as you went through that, of, you know, what your conception was of minor league baseball? What was the difference between what you thought it was and what it really was like? I think the biggest surprise was the... I didn't expect the commitment to the job that the ball players had. Um, I, I think they get, I think they got kind of a raw deal from a lot of the fans who give them a hard time about being spoiled ball players and, and these kids are rich. These kids aren't rich, and there might be one or two that get a pretty decent signing bonus, but you know, they're giving up years of their life. They're giving up college years uh, to go follow a dream, and in a lot of ways, I learned a lot from them. From, from their dedication to the job that helped keep me focused and actually follow my dream, which was to be a writer. 
and and have, have really learned from the ball players I I was there to study. Well, of course, you're using the word dream here quite often, and uh, anybody uh, you know with the subject matter of baseball immediately I think thinks of Field of Dreams. Uh, did that movie uh, uh, inspire you in some way? I think it has to inspire anyone who's a baseball fan. Uh, but as far as the minor league experience, it's it's a very very different experience. Uh, I mean, the thing about Field of Dreams, those guys were idols. You know, those guys were idols coming out of out of the cornfields. And you know, here these guys are they're anonymous when they come in and they're anonymous when they leave. So it's it's really very different. These guys have to have a, uh, an inner drive to stay focused and to keep caring about being ball players. Uh, whether the team is doing well or, or not doing well, they have to care about what they're doing, and they do. Uh, they they're not they're not the 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 foul mouth bar, you know, bar dwelling guys that people picture. They're they're not the the picture that I have of like you know Marines and ball players. You know, as you hear that a lot. And they're not, or at least the guys that I traveled with weren't. I mean, these guys were guys who cared and and weren't out till three, four in the morning out at bars. They had to stay in pretty decent shape and they cared about their job. So, well, David, after doing your study to put the book together, and uh, you may want to give some thought to this, sir. What's the difference? between a community like Jamestown that has 50 years of history of professional baseball and a community next door that has zero involvement in professional baseball? I think it's, um, it's a rallying point. There's uh, something that the, the title of the book is Across the Seams, and a lot of what, that, um, what that's alluding to really is this, this interweaving of people and events and um, uh, really characters, people, and events that are interwoven through this 50 years of baseball and, and really goes back you know, again to, to the 1830s. The difference between a town like where I'm from, from Hillsdale, New Jersey, uh, it's a town of 10,000 people, two square miles. Uh, they don't have a minor league ball club. There's no minor league ball club nearby. There's no focus. There, there's no one chain that all of these events can be hung on. If you think as a writer or or even as a radio, uh, you know, it, as a radio producer, someone who's putting together a show, you need a chain. You need something to hang your narrative on, uh, and whether it's it's an actual piece of work or if it's uh, or if it's just in your head, th there's nothing to hang the history on. There's nothing to hang the narrative on without a ball club. Sounds like I'm talking to a student of the Columbia School of Journalism, I, <laughs> which happens to be the case, right? Our guest is David Millay. We'll learn about this young man, more about him, but also his uh, uh, really uh, uh, endeavor here to make this book uh, almost a textbook for uh, aspiring ball players and for minor league towns to, uh, to study by, I would say. So we'll pause for these messages, and we'll be back with David Millay. continuing the times of your life with our special guest David Moulet, a 23-year-old from Hillsdale, New Jersey, who decided uh, one of the, well, I think it's a, it was a thesis in your college days? Yeah, this was my senior thesis for college, was uh, for honors, and, and uh, yeah, I got a little overambitious, and this could have been, you know, a 50, 60-page thesis and end up about 150, 160 pages, so I got pretty ambitious after that summer. Did you play ball? I just played uh, Little League, Babe Ruth, that was about it. I played a little bit of high school, had uh, falling out with my coach, and then ended up playing tennis. I ended up switching from baseball to tennis. Well, was that enough of a, you know, a, a, a ground, a foundation to say, I want to pursue this in one form or another? Yeah, because, I, I mean, I wasn't going at it as, as a former baseball player. I was going as a budding writer. So, I, I mean, I came here knowing writing is what I want to do, and this was going to be my first my first chance to do it. I mean, what better way than to pick out a subject that you love? And it would just happen to be the minors caught my fancy, and, and uh, you know, I stayed with it ever since. David, as an author, where do you lean more to nonfiction or fiction or historical? It's uh, That's a great question, because it's been a real soul-searching thing I've gone through this summer. Um, I've been doing nonfiction now for four years, really, since my summer here and the preparations that went into that. 
I went to uh, journalism school last year. I graduated in May. It was just a one-year program. So the past three, four years have been really hardcore nonfiction. I mean, journalism, really thorough journalism. And this book is dense. <laughs> I don't know if you've got a chance to go through it, but it is it's dense. Um, and I, I, I think it's time for me to move on to some fiction. So I, I, I'm looking forward to... Uh, my next project is actually going to be as a, as a comedy writer. Uh, that's that's the project that I'm beginning now, and we'll see where that leads. How did you find Jamestown, New York? <laughs> Jamestown found me, kind of. Uh, I had sent uh, cover letters out to all the general managers in the Appalachian League and the New York Penn League. Uh, this was during my junior year of college. And the hope was that, well, actually, the, the reason, to, to back up for a second, the reason I chose those two leagues was they were both short-season leagues. Uh, which means they start second week in June, and they end uh, right around September 1st. So that was the academic year, and they're designed so that the ball players can play and still go back to school. So I was drawn naturally to those two leagues, and uh, two general managers got back to me, uh, one in Pittsfield and one in Jamestown, and Tom O'Reilly just, like I said, rolled out the red carpet, and uh, next thing I knew I was, I was here. And then, of course, that led to uh, when Jamestown began then to uh, you know, the team come back with the, the folks from Niagara Falls and the rich baseball operations. And uh, the calendar told us it was the 50th anniversary, so we began to put together a program to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And we hoped out of that, uh, Greg Peterson and others hoped that a recorded history could come out of all of that celebration and doing. And then a telephone call, I guess, from Greg to you, and here we are today. Well, it's kind of a remarkable story, actually. Uh, the, the turn of events is... <laughs> it's pretty pretty unusual. It was you know the end of my senior year of college. I'm, I'm 21 years old. I had basically finished my thesis and fell in love with writing. This was it. I knew I was going to write. When I graduated, I was going to be a writer. I just didn't know how I was going to proceed in writing a book on minor league baseball. Uh, I obviously had some, some ins here in Jamestown. I was familiar with the subject. But how do you pursue something like this where the research is so... It's just a mammoth task. It's a huge undertaking. And looking back, there's no way I could have done it myself. Uh, and then I get a call in my dorm room a senior year about two weeks before graduation from Greg Peterson, who said, uh, are you interested in getting involved? We're going to be celebrating the 50th anniversary of baseball. I said, sure. I said, I don't know how I can help out. Um, let me send you out my thesis. If you want me to do some writing, great. Uh, at that point, I really didn't have you know, have any real confidence in my writing quite yet. It, it just, I wasn't a professional writer at the point. Well, Greg read it and was impressed for whatever reason. <laughs> he, he liked it and called me back while I was on a road trip, as a matter of fact. It's actually funny. I never told you this, but I actually called Greg from uh, a ball game in Carolina, the Carolina Mudcats. I was at this ball game, double-A team, with five guys, we went on an RV trip. We rented an RV, and we said this was, we were graduating college, so we celebrated by, by taking off for a week. Was in Carolina, gave a call to Peterson, uh, to, to Greg, to see if, uh, if he had gotten my thesis and, and where to proceed, and he says, I want you to write the book. So I was absolutely stunned. I'm here under the lights. The ball game had just ended. My friends are looking at me like, what's going on? I hung up the phone, and, and these guys just uh, handshakes all around, and they said, boy, man, you got a job pretty fast. This was, you know, this was like three days before graduation, and I was already set up with, uh, with the job to write, a, to write a book. Well, we'll take the next chapter of that book here, an oral chapter, okay? Um, the Times of Your Life with our guest, David Millay, who's written a book called Across the Seams, an American story of seasons changing in the minor leagues. We'll be back after these messages.
And a, broad, a broad broadcast of this length to cover 50 years is a, a formidable task, but we will try to uh, certainly uh, get to the deep impressions here of what David Millay has found out in this mammoth task of uncovering the facts, the stories, the uh, anecdotal material that should be part of a book of this kind. Minor League Baseball in Jamestown, New York, with David Moulet. David, we know, uh, since we had an opportunity to chat with you prior to this uh, broadcast, that you credit one gentleman in our community who uh, was a remarkable man in our community. We, uh, the love affair uh, continues even after his passing because of uh, his desire to stay here, even though he was a very talented writer, a great sports uh, writer, uh, respected and I think he had the affection for the minor league game as, as you have it for your writing and I'm certain for the game itself. His name is? Yeah, Frank Hyde. Frank Hyde, the longtime sports editor of the Post Journal. Um, I, I, you know, in a, in a funny way, a great influence on my writing, although I obviously never had a chance to, to meet him. Uh, you know, he was, he was long gone by the time I came here in 1993. Just a, a just remarkable writer and had such a great sense for drama which was really the book would never be close to what it is now if it wasn't for Frank Hyde no question about it um, we were fortunate his wife I guess it was had uh, a chest full of his clippings all of his frankly speaking co columns that go back to uh, the mid 1940s and uh, I went through them and read every one of them every word of them and uh, he just he got at the meat of, of the story here. He, he understood the personal side of baseball here. He was in it. it what, was fa what was fascinating was he was in it He was because he was part of it. I, I mean, he obviously wasn't, he didn't have a distance that I have, you know, coming from New Jersey to see this story. No, he was here. He was part of the story, but still had that ability to see the drama in the everyday, to see the, the folks who were up in the majors, coming down from the majors, uh, you know, the Johnny Newman who had a shot, you know, the, those kind of guys who, um, who a lesser reporter would have, wouldn't have noticed. Uh, Frank Hyde saw it and made, again, the stories in this book possible. You know, it, it's nice to hear that, and, you know, like you and I, Jim, we lived with Frank Hyde, and we enjoyed his column every day, but even for me, now it gives more meaning as I think about Frank and uh, look at some of the stuff that he put on paper. But an interesting comment made at the luncheon with David Molay by Greg Peterson, the fact that uh, David has taken this task upon himself to uh, sort of look back over the history of those columns, read every one of them, and look at the history of, of this ball club, and it's going to be celebrating its 50th year. If this young man did not take that unto himself as his responsibility, his desire, we would not have, between covers, the history of our baseball, our personalities, our wonderful stories that will come out of the pages of that book. So, David, you're to be thanked for uh, for, for taking on a, this this formidable task. Well, I mean, I appreciate it, and and I could I can understand. I mean, there must be a great a great amount of satisfaction, you know, to know that at least that the history is saved, you know, as as a James Tanner. Um, but I can't take so much credit because I, self-interest is the best motivator. And, I, of course, I did this still for myself. You know, it wasn't, I mean, I did this um, so that I could begin my writing career. And it just, it was fantastic that I could get emotionally involved in this you know, and dealing with, with Russ and, and with Greg Peterson to see, I, I tell all my friends back at home, friends and family, what a tremendous civic pride it took to to even begin this project, to ever give me that first call, and then to stay interested in it, and to go to the library, and to go to the microfilm, and have the, the conversations that that you know, that the folks here who've done all of my research for me, uh, 